Hello. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. I'm Naomi Clark. I'm the chair of the NYU Game Center, which is right upstairs. And we are very, very pleased to present uh, the beginning of the 15th annual NYU Game Center Lecture Series. Yay, thanks for the applause. And we're, we're streaming right now. Hello to Twitch, all, all of you out there. And we have a, a full house here, so we're really excited. Um, all right, to introduce tonight's speaker, I want to tell a story that takes place almost 10 years ago. Uh, back in, I think, spring of 2014, which was the actually the very first time I taught a class at the NYU Game Center. Some of you probably have taken this class. It's colloquially referred to as indie RPGs, and I had just come up with the class back then. And there's another class that I think was being taught for the first time that semester too, called Prototype Studio. Uh, and the, the professor who came up with that is sitting in the audience. Wait, wait for everybody. Oh, Bennett, okay, Bennett just, uh, came up with that class. Also, like, been both classes have been running ever since. Prototype Studio, like, way more popular and influential. Uh, my class, sort of like a weird class off on the margins. Um, but Prototype Studio is a class where you make a new game every week based on a prompt that the instructor provides. And it was um, first taught by, by Bennett and more recently has been taught by tonight's speaker, Laura, Laura Seuss Clark. So the, uh, but back then, I was, uh, I was not a full-time member of faculty, but I was called into a meeting of the faculty, which back then was much smaller, um, because Bennett was showing a game that one of the students in Prototype Studio had made. Uh, and, and like, I don't remember if it was Bennett or Frank Lance, the previous chair who will be back here soon, um, summoned me in too. It was like, yeah, come look at this, come look at this. And so I, I watched this and I was like, oh my God. Um, because it was kind of like a music video, but it was interactive, you could control it. I think, I, and um, yeah, or it was a little bit like a, a, a VJ or, or demo scene kind of tool where you could affect the way that the visualization that was sort of going along the, with the music was playing. And it was, uh, showed a, a little female figure who was delivering a message and walk, walking and walking amidst this ever-changing, slightly phantasmagoric, but really brilliantly colored landscape of buildings and colors and shapes, uh, and getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you couldn't sort of tell whether the figure was approaching you or receding into the distance. Uh, and then Bennett explained that one of our students had made this uh, as a kind of elegy for a friend who had just recently died of cancer. Uh, and I was like, that, that's amazing. Uh, that was the sort of first game I think I ever saw that I thought of as like a, a music video game. And then later on, I was like, oh, a bunch of people are making these music video games now, like Sayonara Wild Hearts or whatever. But um, this, this game was actually better than Sayonara Wild Hearts, and I like Sayonara Wild Hearts. Uh, it was just one song, um, and yeah, and so and that was the first time I encountered the work of Laura Suits Clark. Uh, and um, since then, Laura went on to do like, a whole bunch of much better known games. I'm sort of like trying to be like, oh, I had this like the cred of seeing this like early single by this like really cool artist <laughs> that most people don't, don't pay attention to, although you can, I think, I think you can play it online. Um, no, actually, I should, I should mention, yeah, you can watch a video online, but the EXE is broken, Laura. You can't download it. So. Yeah, you can't even watch the video because they copyright it. Oh, I'm sorry. To, oh, man. Okay, so, yeah, it's just so obscure, you can't, you can't even see it now. But um, since then, yeah, you, you can definitely still check out Laura's more recent and well-known work, like their thesis, Rooftop Cop, uh, which is a, a series of five vignettes that explore architecture and climate torn futures and the futility and impossibility of aimless policing uh, and um, a lot of other stuff besides. 
Uh, Laura's Game Witch Ball, created for the 2016 No Quarter exhibition, which was also, yeah, like a fantastic move in a completely different direction that a lot, a lot of people didn't expect for Laura to make a competitive game, but then it was, it was really cool, just showing what a versatile uh, artist Laura is. Uh, and I didn't even mention that, you know, Laura is the, uh, one of the founders of Baby Castles, which for many, many years, uh, has been a, a vibrant part of the New York, of New York City's indie game scene and helped foster so many interesting creative projects through curation and workspace and bringing people together and just making making physical and digital things. Uh, and then, of course, more recently, we're lucky enough to have Laura here as a visiting professor. Uh, and that is, is part of why um, Laura's speaking tonight, because we like to have all of our visiting professors give a talk. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear uh, what Laura's going to say about their current project, uh, Faith Companion. Uh, so without further ado, we'll get right to that. Uh, Laura Suits Clark, everybody. Uh, starting a timer for myself just to make sure things are going. Uh, I, <laughs> I guess I kind of I got called out a little bit uh, for making uh, elegy games. I guess I just keep doing that. I don't know. It feels like a nice way to process stuff sometimes. Um, so yeah. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, I, I title. I had to think of a title for the talk. Uh, I. I called it what am I doing? And I realize it sort of seems like a, like a panic. It's not really a panicked what am I doing? It's more like a, if somebody asks you like, oh, what are you doing? Or like, what are you up to? It's like, hmm, what am I doing? So it's more like that. It's, I feel okay. Uh, <laughs> but it is a, a, pre, a pre mortem. The project is not done yet. I don't know how much longer is left on it, but I figured not a bad time to talk about it. There's some stuff going on. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna, my, not cold open, cool open. Uh, I was gonna go straight into like where I think it came from uh, as like, yeah. Uh, Cause I was trying to think of like, what is the, what was even the genesis point for this thing? Cause it's been a while and it's kind of all over the place. And I was like, it did come from somewhere. Like what was the origin point? Um, and uh, I think that I found like two, it was like, it's a convergence of a lot of things, but there are two kind of primary things that I think uh, caused this project to happen. Um, oh, I guess in brief, uh, I'll describe the project better later, but um, it's kind of, it's about a bunch of dogs in like a poor sort of stagnant town. Um, and there's a lot of people in the game wandering around doing stuff. They're involved in like the local church, like real estate, remote AI work, a lot of things going on. Um, uh, yeah, you, you'll see. So anyway, uh, where it came from um, in, oh, I think that, hold on. There's still music playing when I kill the music. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where that was going. Uh, all right. So uh, in early uh, 2015, um, I uh, lost my dad to ALS, which is a uh, muscular degenerative uh, disease. Um, it kind of just like slowly takes your voluntary muscles first, and then eventually the rest of them. Um, there's kind of no coming back. Uh, it was really weird uh, to watch him kind of like just like slowly lose the ability to do anything um, and uh, my brother and I were taking care of him at the time uh, we were both living there uh, with him in Ohio um, and he died like a couple of weeks I think after I got back from GDC 2015 which I was on the fence about if I should go to because anyway I did um, he wanted me to go it's like that's fine and you got to watch online it was cool um, but the reason I was there is because I was showing uh, my MFA thesis, um, which had been nominated for some IGF awards. Um, that's a screen cap from the awards ceremony, big fancy thing. Uh, and um, yeah, I don't know, you got to watch on stream. That was really nice. Um, and related, uh, someone uh, very close to me currently uh, is involved in like end of life stuff. Um, so like uh, chosen death, usually for like terminal uh, patients, well, always for terminal patients. Um, and I was thinking about, like my dad didn't do that. He kind of just let the, for better or worse, he just let the disease kind of run its course. Um, the only treatment that he really accepted was like 
a coffee mug full of like Jim Beam uh, every night. Uh, that was his entire process. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, so I, I was thinking about, uh, so a lot of ALS patients do, are the people who um, choose their own like kind of way out. Um, and I was thinking about that sort of stuff when I started making um, a mecha game. Um, because, um, like, mecha as imagery uh, is a lot about body stuff. Um, it's often used to explore body-related issues and topics, and I wanted to make something about, like, a final jog. Just, um, like, uh, like, running until you burn up, until all the things that uh, let you move are just gone. Um, and yeah, so this is you know, a few like years later, but uh, this is the first Genesis point um, that I identified. Uh, it's, I don't know, something about being able to choose your final moment for yourself when you know that it's nearby anyway. Um, so I did, I did program out this like first person mech walking thing. Here are some GIFs. Um, I think actually this uh, this Halo-y thing is reused from the thing that the Prototype Studio game that Naomi mentioned. I think I just um, used that because that's you know that was in my head too. Uh, and uh, you know this is it's fine. Like you just press a series of keys kind of in a pattern, um, and eventually you learn the pattern. And you're just kind of repeating it over and over. Um, it allows you to run faster and faster, and eventually you know. Uh, oblivion uh, overtakes you, uh, and you're done. Um, however, yeah, this is also like a showcase of my kind of like busted process where I was like, I gotta get this interior screen thing to work first. It's the, it, yeah. This isn't Game Maker though. It's not. It's not as straightforward. It's kind of fun to make the screen. Um, so anyway, so I, I did this uh, thing and just kind of working on it quietly, um, but it, like. I had this weird feeling that like in isolation, this sequence just is completely meaningless, uh, right? There's no context for it. You can't just tell someone that something is sad and then they're like, it's sad. Uh, it doesn't really work. Um, so I remember in maybe late 2019 or early 2020, something like that, I, um, I walked into Bennett's office, and Bennett was still here, and uh, I, I described something like this idea, and I was like, here's this thing I'm working on. I'm afraid it doesn't mean anything because it's contextless. Uh, and uh, it was kind of just like, yeah, it's, <laughs> you're right. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I thought, well, does that mean I have to like, make an entire game before this? Do I have to make a whole game that happens before that? Um, and uh, yeah, so that's what I've been doing <laughs> for like four years. Um, yeah, I have to uh, earn the conclusion, uh, uh, as it were. So that's origin point number two, uh, I think. So anyway, uh, this is a little bit of an intro talk, uh, kind of. So, uh, which is, it's a little redundant given my circumstances. I've been around for a little bit, but um, in the interest of completeness, uh, here's a little bit about me. I grew up in Ohio, uh, um, which is the well, it's the well of American culture. It is where all American culture comes from. Um, uh, uh, all right, that's the first half of my life. Um, <laughs> what are some other fun facts about me? I can tap dance, kind of. I was in show choir. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, there's, that's enough facts about me. Um, <laughs> it's good enough. There's not that much time. I, there's a lot to cover. Um, I have a, I, my undergrad degree is in audio post-production. I went to school for sound design um, in the great state of Ohio as well. Um, I barely graduated on time. Um, the, uh, I had to fudge some credits in order to do it, uh, thanks to the admins uh, very much there. Um, and this is because I took a class in like, I think literally every department. I just thought that that would be fun. Um, I didn't, I wasn't really paying that close of attention to what I was supposed to be taking. Um, my academic advisor at the time, bizarrely, was Mia Consalvo, who I, apparently is a games academic. I didn't know that at the time. 
um, I, you know, I had no idea what was going on. Um, this was a long time ago. I think that maybe she had one book out or something. I don't know. But yeah, I learned that way later, and I was like, oh, would have been nice to know. Um, yeah, so I had no particular career ambitions at this time. I was kind of just hanging out, being an undergrad. Um, I used like all of my time to record me and my friends bands and the multi-million dollar studio that they had there. Um, just like the crispest possible sound on like really nice microphones uh, and recording equipment. And then I just converted everything into MP3s and emailed them to myself. Um, and I did all of the mixes on like GarageBand 1.0, like the 2004 version that I had on my laptop. Um, but honestly, so I found this to be way more fun uh, and compelling than like sealing myself inside the like designed objectness of like a studio um, away from like the elements and all context. Uh, like Pro Tools and like studio vibes and stuff kind of suck the fun out of the activity for me. Um, anyway, a moment of self-discovery. Um, I kind of carried that lesson uh, with me on into other things. Uh, anyway, after that, I ended up in um, Southwest Ohio, uh, <laughs> Los Angeles, to, to be more specific. Um, yeah, I, I found like the film and television industry to be just kind of like a bad fit for me. I tried it, but it was really just a bummer. It was just everyone else, that's kind of what they were doing. And uh, I don't know, I, I didn't really like it. So I, I ended up working in, in fashion, retail, and mostly operations, um, lots of st warehouse stuff, um, organizing clothing for like five years uh, between Los Angeles and New York. Um, <laughs> There's, there's like nothing to say about this period, actually. It's kind of just like the dark void of my mid-20s. It's, it's fine. It's gone. It's over. I feel okay now. But hey, in 2012, uh, I ended up here. Um, well, not, yeah, here, here. Uh, so I was in the uh, first class of MFAs um, at the Game Center um, in 2012. Uh, that's us in the beginning. That's us at the end, most of us. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, by some stroke of luck, I found the application like a, the week it was due, um, and I wrote everything real, real fast, and yeah, they let me in. Um, uh, yeah, so also from about 2012 to 2019, 2020-ish, um, I was pretty active in this uh, volunteer-run uh, video games collective called Baby Castles, which might be familiar to some old folks here. Um, <laughs> uh, it's like sort of in hibernation now, but it was really good for a lot of people, especially me, um, because I don't really like the internet very much, um, and Baby Castles was extremely offline, which I appreciated. Uh, all right, that's enough about me. I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna move on into the actual, the game stuff. Uh, all right, so, uh, like I said, there's a lot of little, it's kind of made up of a lot of little things. Um, some big things, um, but uh, I kind of want to talk about all the tiny pieces first. So uh, during grad school, I found myself enjoying making small scale things. Um, as Naomi mentioned, I was in Prototype Studio. Um, I really liked that class um, and still do. Uh, and somehow through that, I was like, oh, it is kind of nice to just make some very contained idea and kind of explore that. And I found that to be kind of it worked well with the way I liked to approach things. Um, and also, uh, really kind of every genre of video game um, is interesting to me in some way, and so I thought it would be fun to try and make one of uh, every kind of game. A fun challenge, maybe. Uh, so after finishing uh, a game called uh, Witch Ball in 2017-ish, uh, I spent the next couple of years kind of just making a lot of little things, um, whatever seemed like a fun genre or mechanical exploration or whatever. Uh, I just sat down and did it for a little bit until I didn't want to do it anymore, and then I would put it away. I wasn't in the habit of releasing games. I kind of just made them, and then I would just do something else. Uh, and that continued up until that conversation that I had um, with 
I mean, I would say a conversation with Bennett, but I kind of just had the conversation with myself in Bennett's office. Bennett probably doesn't even remember this occurring. I think that I would just go in there sometimes and just like think out loud and then leave. Um, yeah. Uh, so at, at that point, I, I kind of realized that like, oh, you know, oh, I have to make this whole other game that leads up to the conclusion point or whatever. But uh, at that point, I, I realized and like reluctantly embraced that like actually everything that I had been making was literally what <laughs> the lead up to this other game. So I should just treat it that way uh, in, in some form or another. Um, so I was like, oh, it's all one big game. All these things are actually just, they're all one. Uh, we're all one, you know. Um, yeah, surprise, surprise. So uh, I also had this really long, um, oh yeah, there's the next thing. I also had this really long document, this is like half of it, um, that I started on like the plane ride back from GDC in 2015. Um, it was just, I don't know, some sort of a, like a narrative exploration a little bit, some stuff about dogs at a church. Um, it had essentially over the years become like a joke repository um, where any time I thought of anything that was vaguely funny, I would just write it down, just in case. Um, and uh, yeah, so I had been making these tiny systems about things that I was interested in, um, in the moment that I was interested in them. Uh, and you know, this is like, it's kind of true for everybody, but like all of your interests are connected in some way. Um, and you can just like look for that way, uh, right? So that's all it is. Uh, Finding ways to like link things together um, that didn't necessarily start that way. Uh, it's a fun exercise in narrative design, I guess, if nothing else. Um, so I also spent a lot of time making these like really low res environment drawings um, that I don't think anyone has seen. I don't think I, yeah, who else would I have shown these to except for now? Um, but the the uh, I was specifically with the intent of not using them for a game because I had this weird habit of like only making things that were for use for something else. And so I was like, no, I'm just going to make these little environment drawings um, and not for any particular purpose. Um, sort of a personal challenge. Uh, and so I had all these little drawings and I had all these other little games and things. Um, and as I started putting them together, my like narrative documentations and spreadsheets got cleaner and I started to like slowly like carve things into into like shapes uh, that made sense to me and I was like oh it's a it's a big game it, it looks real there's like tiny parts and I have spreadsheets like a real game designer uh, and stuff like that. Um, they still look a little wild though because they're only referenced by me like nobody else needs to see these but I do really like making spreadsheets so I'm gonna keep doing it. Uh, so, uh, all right, what am I even going on about? You've not even seen any of the thing. I'm just, just vaguely describing outlines to you. I don't know if that's very interesting. Um, so yeah, this is a collection of kind of like smaller game experiences. There's a lot of them. I don't, at this point, I'm not totally sure what the numbers are. Uh, they're scattered around a bit, um, but they're fairly constrained in both uh, time and location in terms of narrative. So it should hopefully be not super confusing um, but, uh, uh, when people play it, but who knows. Uh, so each part in the game highlights like a uh, some aspect of or character within uh, this particular town, I, I guess. Um, a lot of repeat locations like the church, cemetery, um, there's a, like a car repair shop kind of thing. Um, one of the uh, primary characters uh, in the game, mm, this one, uh, is terminally ill. So that's the link from the other one. So this is our sort of mech pilot, so to speak. Um, and they have decided to end their own life. And the game's story largely revolves around um, the day after their like goodbye party and it is about all the people who couldn't make it uh, to the goodbye party. Um, so that sounds a little roundabout, um, but that's kind of what all the exploration points are. Um, it bounces between three different uh, time periods, I guess you could say. Uh, so, and I do them with color palettes, kind of my 
way of exp you know helping explain. Um, there's like there's now ish or like the time of this particular goodbye party thing. Um, there's 50 years afterwards uh, and 50 years before. Uh, so why not? Um, I don't know. I like uh, those like that stretch of time in any in any place is like an interesting uh, thing to look at. I think. Um, and so I've been referring to this game when I describe it to other people um, as uh, allegorical fantasy. I don't know how a better there's a better way to describe it. Um, it's so it's like li largely just fantasy interpretations of real stuff, real things that are happening. Uh, I'm I'm pretty basic when it comes to that. Uh, I just kind of like write down jokes, and then when I have enough, uh, I fool myself into like it's a narrative. There's a narrative bunch of jokes. Um, but I will say uh, that style um, of writing can get kind of tricky because uh, as time goes on um, your jokes of like medium insight uh, can start coming true um, and it makes the portrayal in the work seem a little tacky. Um, so I try, I try to like zoom out a little bit more, work with broader strokes. If I get too specific uh, I run the risk of things, things happening. Um, so here's some stuff that happened while I was working on this game. I was like, all right, I gotta like de-emphasize that part because uh, it'll it'll seem ridiculous. Um, I had these like eco-fascist fairy characters, um, and I thought it was really cool. And then whatever, I gotta de take that part out. So they're in there somewhere. Um, yeah. So a, a lot of um, a lot of early threads and directions. Um, I'll, I'll stay on this slide. A lot of early threads and directions in the game that are, like places that it was maybe going to go or forms that it was maybe going to take, I kind of had to abandon them or de-emphasize them, right, because overall life circumstances. Um, the game wasn't, it's not supposed to be about like cheap jokes on these topics, that's not the idea. Uh, it's more about like how all this stuff kind of grows from the same soil. So it's like a story about the soil. It's a dirt simulator game. So and a lot of this stuff is gonna just be in the background. You don't you don't need to know it. You don't need to know what I was thinking about. Um, uh, it can just it's just it's for me, you know. Although a lot um, many of the things that I kind of took out um, are still in the game. I just put them in rooms, and there's a section of the game called the reliquary. It's just a museum where I dumped all the ideas I didn't want to explore anymore, and you can just go into the rooms and look at them. Uh, and they're just they don't they're just detect, uh, decontextualized from the rest of the game. Um, I have a really a pretty funny story about one in particular, but I'll save it for the Q and A if there's time. I, I'm not going to tell it now. Um, but yeah, yeah. all right. So um, when it comes to making sense of like events and characters, I've just been devoting like a single game experience to moments that I think need it. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, representing things uh, in the game for a moment, and then I'll also demo some stuff because I think it might be fun. Uh, so, yeah, first of all, so it's a work of fantasy, right, as I mentioned, allegorical fantasy. So there are monsters in the game. There are monsters here. Um, necromancers, giants, dragons, just like really corny classical monsters. I think that they're funny. Um, but I have uh, fantasy creatures in here uh, because their like inhumanness is rhetorically useful. Um, so I personally kind of like I dislike the idea of fantasy races. I think that interpretations of a race as a species is kind of it's not my thing. So it's not like that. Uh, these are all people. Um, their uh, particular monsterness is just. A reflection of their like power relations, I guess you could say, or, or, or status. Um, so, you know, the 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 giants in the game are just extremely visible um, and long lived, but it's unclear if they really do anything important. Um, there, you can just see them. Uh, there's like a real estate conglomerate that's represented by a hydra, that sort of thing. Um, I just don't know how else to portray them. Uh, so. In order to make sense of the like necromancer characters, which are important to the story, 
Um, there's an entire section of the game uh, for their uh, worldview. Um, so I, I'm actually just gonna to I'm gonna show you um, that part of the game. Um, uh, hopefully the, it's still up. Yeah, here it is. Um, all right. So this is my um, <laughs> my map. Uh, all right, so the, the necromancers in this game are your kind of um, standard uh, capitalist folks. Um, that's, that's what they are. Um, and uh, so it's, please excuse my crude programmer art. Someday I will, as a reward, I do all the visuals at the end. So most of it's going to look kind of dumpy for a long time. That's OK. Um, <laughs> All right, so this is a one-player board game. The idea here is not that it lasts very long or that it's very repeatable. It just needs to say what it needs to say and then get out and be done. Um, so you have a little piece you can move around. That's the necromancer. Um, and uh, there are two major resources in this little simulation, uh, blood and bones. I am using blood to represent variable capital and bones to represent fixed capital. So. Blood is value, right? You, the necromancer wants to just take it from people forever. That's why blood is, is like, it's a rate. It's not an amount. It doesn't matter how much. It's how much, you know. That, <laughs> uh, and then bones are, well, you know, it's what's left over. It's like long after you're gone, it's you still working for the boss. It's the materials um, of your labor that just kind of sit around and are used to build things. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and pick up some bones. Um, every time I place the token down, it's one turn. Um, so I'm gonna grab some bones. Uh, it's very important that the bones be physical objects. You got to play with them. Um, also, they have weight. They weigh this little plate down, and it gives you access to different things. Right, uh, so I'm just going to put some bones in the bone machine. Right there. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, I can start uh, building some canals. Uh, you want to so the green things are like living spaces, is where people are, whatever you know that is. Uh, and you just want to like kind of link those places up to your little blood pit here. It's just a big repository where all the blood goes. Um, and then yeah, I'm getting it, and you can see the rate has increased here. That's nice. Um, and uh, yeah. So it takes your fixed capital to construct these canals, and then you start draining blood from people. Um, but you'll notice there's this little meter over here. This is the, kind of the most recent addition, because I was like, there's got to be something that pushes back against you. You can't just be doing this the whole time. Um, so this, is, this little meter here is like a, is a ratio of blood to bones. And you want to keep it in the middle. Um, because if people are, in this case, yeah, they're emboldened, which means they're underexploited, um, and you've got you've got too many bones. Right? So you want it. <laughs> if you have too many bones and people have a lot of energy, you look really suspicious. You have a big vault full of bones, and everyone's like, I have a lot of time on their hands. Um, and so you you want to like be draining more labor from them so that they don't have time to bother you. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, let me just like, goodbye. Get rid of all these. If, on the other hand, um, you don't have, yeah, OK. It didn't quite go all the way. But yeah, that's in the, it's in the good category. Um, if you have not enough banked bones um, and they are overexploited, they get uh, restless, right? Because they're clear, they feel overexploited, but also you're kind of you don't have any stuff to back it up, right? Uh, so I was thinking just like the you know the mind of uh, yeah and ex ex the exploitation class. Uh, so that's all this is. It's a little um, uh, yeah time to learn the family business. Um, it's just a little one-player board game sim thing, and I hope will take maybe like 20 minutes or something as part of this larger game. Um, just a way to explore the uh, necromancer's mind. Oh yeah, um, I, if if you start a turn and this meter is off, the, the, that's like the little giants show up, um, and they they wander across the board. They break your canals and stuff. 
but they can also gentrify space for you. Um, if they land on a cemetery, um, let's see if I can make a cemetery real quick. If they land on a cemetery, um, they will turn it into like a forested space, which is useless to you, but if they land on a forested space, it becomes livable again, and you can drain all the labor out of it. It's really, really nice, good for you. As a, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, a couple other ones that I think are worth showing. Um, pretty different. So this particular part is um, diegetically a game. So there is a, there's a teenager character in the game who's like, do you want to try this game that I'm working on? And you're like, sure. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a representation, essentially, of um, like an early game designer's attempt at, I don't know, showing something in the world. So um, it's like a turn-based strategy game where they're, they're clearly trying to represent something, but it ends up just being like this kind of uh, like overindulgent goblin punching game um, where you, uh, it's like battleship style. These, these things are gonna hit you on the exact square that they're on. So this is gonna hit me on the top of my head. Um, this one's gonna move. I'm just gonna place an attack here and just like let it go. Um, so you're supposed to just sort of like play this game that the kid is making and they're like, what did you think? And you're like, it's fine. Um, so I made this in like a week or something. I was listening to a lot of Dungeon Synth, or, I think. And, uh, and, and then I stopped. I stopped working on it for like six months and I came back to it and I was like, I have no idea how this works. I can't finish this. And so it's done. It's just been sitting in exactly the state for like two years. And uh, I just, I'll replace the art and I, I plopped it in. Uh, it's good enough. Um, well, let me show you the good part. Uh, I gotta beat some some goblins here, um, really quickly. All right, it's three rounds, so one more round. I'm almost done. Um, I, can, I think I can take this one out, wherever it is. So let me just. Okay, yeah, it's over here. All right. Okay, so uh, the this was all <laughs> all this part was just the setup for like what I really wanted to do was like be able to draw my own armor on my character. Uh, so I got some treasures. I got a leather crayon and a cloth spray paint, which is really good, and some sort of a knife. Um, and now, uh, so da da damage is calculated uh, per pixel whenever they hit me. It's whatever, whatever part they hit me on. And so I can just, if I have leather crayon, I can just draw some armor on my arms. <laughs> yeah. And then I have cloth spray paint. I should do some on my body. <laughs> but I should just cover my whole face. Because it's a vulnerable part, right? Uh, yeah, I'll get my shins. Th that hurts if you get hit in the shins. Yeah, that's good enough. Yeah, so now when they hit me and it's calculating damage per pixel, I take slightly less damage because there's cloth there or there's leather there or whatever. Um, anyway, yeah, that was the entire joke. It was just, can I get to this joke? And I did it. And it's done. I don't need to go any further. <laughs> I think that's good enough. Um, yeah, so it will sit in there as a juxtaposition to the other sort of like more crunchy systemy games. Uh, I think it works okay. Uh, there are other stupid ones. I'll briefly show this traffic game. One of the characters is in trouble um, because they were playing in traffic. I thought it would be funny to make a game about um, trying to herd uh, self-driving cars in a tunnel. So it's like you want to get the cars to go to the right, and your friend wants to get them to go to the left, and you just play in traffic. And they're going, to sw they're going to swerve around you. So pretend these orange things are cars. Just pretend. Oh, yeah, if you want to know what the score is, you just ask, what's the score? <laughs> I'm, I'm tied. How am I tied to my own AI? It's so bad. Right. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. There's those things, but, but actually, um, most of the time you, uh, uh, you play as a dog. You play as dogs, many dogs. Um, and uh, the reason for this is that I think um, like a dog's relationship to the world is a lot like uh, people's relationship to games. Um, they're kind of like... They don't really care about what's going on. They're just there to like hang out and have fun. They don't have any particular moral position or they're not really worried about 
what's going to happen. They're, they're just they're happy to 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 be there um, to, and to hang out. And so, in most of the, most of this game, you just walk around as dogs, and people are having their problems around you, and there there's text happening and things like that. Um, but you can just walk away. Um, and there's some you play fetch sometimes. It's pretty fun. Um, I, I'm splitting the controls. Anything that a dog does is the arrow keys, and anything that a person does is the mouse. So try to keep it uh, separate that way. Um, um, all right, I'm going to go back to the slides. You can hit the lights. Um, it's enough of this. Enough of this. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so uh, some inspirations, I guess, oh, conceptual inspirations, I think are worth pointing out. Um, I was thinking a lot about uh, like time and memory also. Um, obviously there's a, there's a time component to this. The dogs are like unbounded by time. They kind of just are wherever is useful for the story. Um, they're just walking around and then the time period will change and it's still the same dog. It doesn't really matter. Um, so I was just you know thinking about the past and the future both being like a construction. Probably any historian will, will admit that, yeah, the past is it's a construction. It's whatever, you're working with whatever you got. Um, and uh, so that also kind of got me thinking a lot about uh, vaporwave. Um, and let me tell you what I mean. <laughs> this is our vaporwave information. Uh, because there are, I think, like two vaporwaves. Um, one is the sort of uh, collage-like Nostalgia for nostalgia, the VHS clips kind of things, um, the slow mall music and that sort of stuff. And then there's also the kind of like retcon version, uh, which is just pure aesthetics. It's like already a reinterpretation of the original form. Um, and it's like a pastiche version of Vaporwave, like not even 10 years later. Um, uh, both of these are very interesting um, in different ways uh, and uh, kind of useful cultural touchstones, I think. I want to bring up one specific example here because I think it's funny. Um, that's the theme. And it's this video. It's this YouTube video. Um, so this is kind of just your average like music compilation with like a still image. Um, I think it's maybe lightly animated or something. Um, but the image itself and the comment section are really good. Uh, and it's because the original title of this video was It's Sunset in 1998, and you're on AOL. And the comment section are like, that Pepsi can is from 1991. <laughs> That's old Pepsi. <laughs> or like, the music sounds like it's from 1988, not 98. Uh, and so, the, whoever uploaded the video, they changed the title to 91. Um, but of course, there wasn't really AOL in 91, not the way that people are thinking of it, right? That was not until like the mid 90s. Right? So none, I mean, obviously there's a lot of other weird <laughs> like going on with this image. Like it doesn't really make sense, but that's kind of the point, I think, right? Um, the rest of the comments are like these desperate anecdotes about youth. Uh, apparently everyone was 14 at some point, who knew? Um, <laughs> But like a lot of them are just like, oh, I remember when I was young, I was five. And people are like, oh, I remember when I was young, I was 25. And it's like, it doesn't, that's, those are completely like very different life points. Um, and so like, whatever vague period is being evoked here for the person listening to this YouTube compilation, um, the time like doesn't matter, right? Like the exact timing of this period doesn't matter. It doesn't even exist. It's not even a real time. Uh, but it doesn't need to be. Uh, it's just, it's like the idea of that time, like whatever you think that time is, is like, that's the place. That's the place that everyone somehow is going to. Um, it's like the, the only real place. Um, so this kind of like shared, but invented memory is interesting to me. Um, so Vaporwave is like a cultural thread, like, it's a little bit like web memes and stuff to some extent. They have like this soup-like nature, right, where they're just made of lots of other stuff, um, which contemporary AI is also doing this sort of thing. It's a soup. Um, 
But this is kind of the more culturally interesting version of it, I think. Um, so with something like uh, Vaporwave, people are essentially acting as the AI, right? They are mixing and mashing things, often anonymously, but anonymously by choice. Um, and you know, this is all to say that that sort of um, thing is uh, the inspiration for the town in the game being all like remote labor. They are all people pretending to be AI for other people. Um, you go to work and you are someone's smart fridge or whatever. Um, which, th that's, that's real, I didn't make that up. People, you know, there are, there are people out there who are the AI shoppers or whatever. Um, all right, so uh, relieving our vaporwave intermission here. Uh, in a moment. Let me get some vapor wave. Yeah. Okay. So up until this point on all the games and stuff that I've made, I worked alone. I did my uh, master's thesis. It didn't start out alone, but it got there eventually. Um, <laughs> And uh, my other releases, like Witch Ball and stuff like that, I just, I made those on my own. Um, and uh, so part of the reason that's easy-ish to work all these themes and, and stuff that I'm talking about into um, one game is because I just do whatever I want. <laughs> no one's going to be like, that doesn't make sense, or I don't really want to put that in there. I kind of just, it just ends up there. So, um, but yeah, it, it's not... The best. Uh, it requires a lot of simplification. Um, so here are some strategies for simplifying things. Um, some dialogue that I wrote. Uh, so there are, I think, some useful ways of like heavily simplifying aspects of your game uh, for work. I try to like do ex like very few frames for anything. I don't animate anything except for like the dog is animated. It's like six frames or something. Um, Nothing moves. If a character needs to be at point A and point B, I just put them at both places. They don't need to move there. They can just be there. Um, so, you know, I try to think of like easy and repeatable like workflows for assets, something that I can do like really quickly so I don't have to keep coming back to them. Um, all the color palettes are handled by code. All my sprites are grayscale. I just color them in the engine so that I can change what they look like um, whenever I want. Um, easy to palette swap and things like that. I wrote all these down, why didn't I? Yeah. Uh, also, kind of maybe more importantly, is simplifying for expectation. Um, so just like keeping an eye on like the promise level of your game, like what is it suggesting to people? What is it promising? Um, like what is the expectation for a game that looks a certain way? Uh, and you can use that to your advantage because you can make your game look worse. But then if it's better, it, like people get are surprised <laughs> or something. I don't know. Um, so yeah, some, some things that I'm trying currently, I don't know if I'll stick with them. Um, but in terms of that is I, I dropped the frame rate to 30 visually. Um, feels a lot better. It's kind of choppy, but it's like a little bit more cinematic. Game still runs at whatever, 60. Um, but visually, it looks uh, choppier. Um, also, I only have sound effects or music, not both. I just choose, does the scene need sound effects? If it doesn't, then music will go there. Um, but I don't do both. It's like kind of arcadey, like very old arcadey. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's just like, it's like constraining things where like I have to do slightly less and also it seems like a stylistic choice um, and kind of like changes the expectation level. Um, this sort of thing, uh, this kind of like constraining the expectation is I think why something like Undertale works really well. Because um, this game looks bad. It looks so bad. Um, <laughs> but like the, it like lifts the narrative up, right? Uh, it has this really crude, like the pixel density is all over the place. Um, what, is this o what is this oval thing? Can someone please? I hate it. Um, there's like no color palette, um, but it looks really friendly and inviting. Um, and like a friend made it. Uh, it's like got 
the aura of like an authentic find, like authentic with a capital A, uh, you know? And I think that like alongside the complexity of the narrative, like the sort of surprising nature of like where it goes, uh, those things work like hand in hand. If this looked way better, I don't know if it would be more popular. I think it would be less popular. Um, it's like, it doesn't need to look any better. It's like uh, your friend's second game and it's like it can just stay like this because it has that approachability, right? You could just suggest this to someone and they're like, oh yeah, okay, I'll try it. And then they're surprised by the narrative. It like works really well. Um, yeah, so, you know, I say that like, oh, I'm working alone and I, yeah, it's like 99% alone, but not exactly alone. Like I have some collaborators on some sections. I have a whole um, uh, thank you slide at the end um, for, for everybody. Um, but there are also people that I confer with regularly um, and people who have contributed to the project in some way or another um, in the past or who are kind of on now. Uh, but a lot of the time spent working on this game is like invisible. Um, it's just like time spent in conversation or thinking about things. Um, hanging out with people is really important. Um, game Maker keeps track of how much time you spent in the IDE on a given project. I have like a thousand-ish hours of programming, but that's like, doesn't account for like the visual stuff, all the spreadsheets, just like narrative planning, things like that. So who knows how long the game has taken or will take. Um, and I don't know, spending so much time on a solo project is, it's like crushingly lonely at some times, but also it's like, in a lot of ways, it's like the only way for something to exist like this. It's pretty all over the place. Um, it'd be hard to convince anyone that all of it was a good idea, that's okay. Um, so I refer to this as an individual effort, but the individual is actually a very fuzzy concept. What is an individual? Um, when, uh, yeah, when the, like, the US government was erasing people's minds with acid and electroshock therapy, they kind of found nothing underneath. People are just like mostly a construct of their social environment. Um, and uh, the individual is actually really difficult to define biologically even. Um, the best, de I, I tried pretty hard. Uh, the, be the best definition of the individual that I can find so far, and if you have a better one, let me know, is this, which is that you can literally interpret the body of an organism as a guess about the structure of the environment and by acting in ways that maintain the integrity of those expectations over time, an organism defines itself as an individual apart from its surroundings. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, th so the reason I like this definition of an individual is because it scales forever, up and down. You can get really small with this, you can get really big with this, and it just, it works. Um, so, you know, individualism and collectivism are often presented as a dichotomy, uh, but, in truth, one kind of fits inside the other like forever in, in all directions. Uh, and um, in the case of this particular project, uh, and really anything, um, a lot of like, for example, a lot of the story elements and like planning stuff just wouldn't exist without conversations that I had with Lillian or like Blood Standard, the necromancer game that I demoed earlier. I don't think I would have done that at all if I didn't have like Alexander's design help um, initially on, in the beginning of it. Um, I probably would have just been like, ha that would be funny if I made that um, and not done it. Uh, so, and there are like infinite moments that I shared with like friends um, who like have helped shape this in some way or another. And uh, well, that'll just keep happening. It'll continue to, to be the case. Uh, so uh, Faith Companion then is also kind of like a, a game about like different kinds of aloneness um, there's like both good and bad uh, kinds of aloneness. Um, it's a little bit about the ways that it's like can be forced upon people um, by design or through like emergent effects of bureaucracy and things like that. But also the way that people choose aloneness for themselves. Um, that's important too. Um, and finding people within like shared isolation, things like that. Um, and uh, it would take too long to give like a full narrative rundown here uh, of, of 
things that are happening in the game, but a lot of the characters in the game are, they're all just making the same mistake, um, which is that they're acting alone against threats that have themselves collectivized. Um, and, you know, one little hammer swing against like a linked mesh of power structures is like not gonna work. But um, acting alone expressively is like the honor and privilege of being alive, I think. It's like essential human dignity. Um, so the work here, um, capital W work, uh, is not all, is not, hasn't just been like whamming the keyboard for hundreds of hours. Um, it's, it's just like out living among people and having a, a nice time. Um, and uh, I hope to uh, live at least long enough to finish this game. Uh, that's my goal, that's my only goal. Yeah, here's my special thank you slide. Uh, that's it from me. That's it, thanks. Oh yeah, let's do it. Okay. Do we have to turn these on, or wait? Well, there's two. One is there's for two of them. Oh, okay, great. So if I pick, if I if I turn this, if I turn this on, then it'll work. Okay. Awesome. And we're just getting the camera set up. So Laura, you might need to. Yeah. Which one is it? Grab that one out of the uh, stand there. Mm -hmm. Come on, buddy. Awesome, so we're gonna chat a little bit and then we'll take questions from you all in the audience and uh, even including, I have here in my hand, uh, Twitch chat, folks on Twitch, if, you're, if you wanna ask questions, feel free to stick them in here and I'll, we'll take questions from online too. Um, yeah, but I get to talk to you first. Uh, so, so wait, so you are making game all alone, mostly, except mostly. for all these no, people no. on the, yeah, all the people on the, do you, how, how do you feel about collectivism in the in the creative context? I mean, it sounds like you did in this closing quote that you just said, which I don't know that's that's maybe your own word, so you're not quoting anyone else. Anyone else? No. Um, but I'm going to quote you on that because in the future, we're looking at this record the recording because that's a great. It's actually a great quote. Which one? The, the at the very end when you said talked about how um, expressing yourself alone is an essential part of yeah. human dignity. Yeah, everybody should be able to do it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm wondering, how do you feel? Do you feel like that kind of thing fits into larger patterns of um, <clears throat> collectivism when it comes to creativity uh, as somebody who's mostly worked alone? Yeah, I guess I wanted to contrast that with like, um, like the auteur thing, or what's the French like bad baby? Right. So, so you, um, don't, you don't consider yourself an auteur. I'm right? not a bad baby. Yeah. No, it's like, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, th it's, it, it's not about uh, like um, that. It's more sort of for you and for people around you. It's like sh letting people know who you are and, and they are also doing the same thing. But then you kind of have to, you come together for other things. Um, and then that subset it's also part of a larger group and on and upwards. But like when it comes down to you know you as a person, you should be able to like make little creative things as part of yourself. Yeah. Right, right. And uh, and then sort of be part of a scene and do collabs. Yeah. And things yeah. like that. Yeah. The people around even if you're like working alone, like there's people around you. Like that's right. help it's helping you. Yeah, and then some people sort of it's it's more natural somehow, I guess, for people to uh, they like pair up or work in a trio something and they're like, oh, this is just works for me, right? Yeah, yeah, some people, I don't know, some people find that really early on. I, had, I have worked closely with people in the past, in grad school mm -hmm. especially, um, but since then, I don't know, like, I, yeah, I'm happy to help out. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> so yeah, you're available for collabs. <laughs> well, once you <laughs> once you get done with this project, or maybe not. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing is like I, I my usual process is like I, I have a bunch of stuff that I want to do, and once something else becomes like 
I'm like, oh, I really want to do this instead. That's why I know I need to wind down what I'm currently doing and so I can move on. But with this one, yeah, there are other things I want to make, but I want to stop doing that process because it's much hard. I feel like I should work with someone else from the beginning. And from, not, oh, from the beginning, yeah. Yeah, because this yeah. was already like, when I was like, hey, do you want to help me with this thing? It's like, there's 40 years of work on it already. And like, right. mm, it's just like kind of hard to people. In well, well, some of the, the folks here on the slide have worked with you more recently than others, right? So they're, you know, people are... That's true, but it's different when it's like someone doing music because they... Right, right, as opposed to doing some... But you're still making more... Are you making more mini-games? And would you I've work stopped. with them? I'm starting... I cut them. Sometimes cut them. my like okay. my work day is, like, I open the project file, and then I'm like, there's three things I'm just never going to do, and I just and decide delete forever it. to cut them. I'm never going to come back to them, and I just close the project. That's, that that's is beautiful. Job. I mean, that's yeah. a huge <laughs> amount of accomplishment just by deleting three things. You've well, gotten so much work just, done. <laughs> They're still there. I'm just not going to do them. I well, moved them to the top right corner of that map. That you I, I give you permission to remove them from your mind. Oh, there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's good. The, uh, um, but I, I consider that like, yeah, that's huge forward progress of some kind. Well, it's, I mean, sometimes it's hard to throw away old like work or whatever, but yeah. when you get to a point and it's been so long, it becomes easy to get rid of stuff. You're just right. Like, no. Yeah, that's why I think it's a beautiful point in the life cycle of a project, maybe, when it just becomes more obvious, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. No. really interesting. The, um, do you ever do this thing where you, in order to gain momentum on your main project, you're like, I have all of this stuff buzzing inside of my head. I have to like make a, t a little side project. Um, uh, so, How do you think this happens? Oh, okay. So this is just your accumulation of detritus. Is this, yeah. Okay. And so now you have to deal with it. Oh, okay, so this is kind of, would you describe this as a creative equivalent of like the room where you put stuff that doesn't fit in the rest of your house and now you're like, oh my God, we got to clean it's that room. It's the real room. It's the real room. <laughs> Amazing. I, I, you know, that, that's a good, I, I feel like a lot of people just never, either never open that room or it's like that, in order to keep from building up, they're like, okay, I guess that's my next project. Um, also funny is we're in New York and it's like, imagine having another room. Yeah, I know, I know, seriously, they're, oof. <laughs> Someone's like, room? Mm? Yeah, I used to have a room like that, and then a, a baby appeared in it. Oh, uh, so yeah, that's, like, that'll happen. Shoot. Um, I want to ask you about allegories. Okay, uh, yeah. Since you said this is an allegorical game, right? It's an allegorical fantasy game, which, which right. is, like, the only way I can describe it. Like Wizard of Oz, right? Wizard of Oz. We, I mean, I, that's sort of what I was going to ask you. It's like, are there particular allegorical fantasies that you, you feel like are influential or that you like? that you want to capture that, that allegorical fantasy vibe? I don't know. I mean, Wizard of Oz is the first one that comes to mind. Right. Right, because the original text is like a, it's like a labor dispute there, right? Well, so that's, that's actually also what I was going to ask you about. Because uh, it came to mind, and I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe somebody in the audience like wants to, who, who like likes multitasking or can't concentrate on one thing, wants to look this up. But I'm not sure whether this is just an apocryphal story that the Wizard of Oz is, was meant as a metaphor for the conflict between the gold standard and the silver standard in the United States and how different groups like the industrial workers of one part of the country and agricultural workers in a different part of the country, those are like what the different parts of the land of Oz are supposed to represent. And the Emerald City is green because it's like the capital and it all operates on money and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. I, I mean what I what I had heard was like this like the scarecrow is the peasant. Right. Class. Yeah, they're the and agricultural the, workers or peasant class. Yeah, and then the tin man is like the late, like the workers, but they don't have a heart because they, they won't ally with the peasants and who don't have a brain, they don't understand but and there's like the banks so the witches and, I right, know. but I don't know if it's true. Yeah, so is it, it, is it true or not? Me. Right, so I guess I'm wondering, like, you know, operating on the assumption for a second that, like, we're like, oh, that's somebody's interpretation that came along later, just like the fact that you can, I guess, apparently play uh, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon while watching The Wizard of Oz, and, like, it all lines up amazingly <laughs> well or something. <laughs> that how, if you, as someone making an allegory, you were talking about how you were worried about, like, if things seem like stuff in the real world, that people are gonna be like, oh, this is what Laura's trying to say. It's a commentary about Grimes. Uh, yeah, it's okay. like you have horror, so you're like, oh my God, you don't want that to happen. Maybe we just did that to L. Frank Baum, 
Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Could be. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's. I don't know. There were parts where I was like I could see where something was going or it's like had some historical precedent for happening multiple times and so I would be making there would be some character or something in the story that I had written down and it's like oh it's going to go this way and then something in the news would happen and it's like yeah, if I like if this is too big a part of it it'll just seem like I'm directly referencing it and so I just kind of like, so you so you had to cut it and you rather than trying to obscure it or something like that yeah, sometimes they're just in there, but I like de-emphasize them. De-emphasize them. Like the, the fascist fairy characters. They're right, right, yeah. They're, they're just in the backgrounds now? Yeah. And, and, still and, and wait, so the fascist, the fascist fairy characters, you're like, this character looks too much like Grimes? Or, no, it was, or like, just like, it was like a particular kind of like, um, this was all pretty dime square stuff, you know? Like, uh, it was like the teal books, like all the like sort of, um, libertarian VC money that would go into like parties, right? Or uh, th something about I don't know. Grimes always just struck me as like kind of in that way, and then it turned out he kind of was. Like, right, sure. Yeah. Is, yeah. Um, but then also like uh, you know ecofascism, which is just like a eco-focused sort of thing. And I was like that. Though I could see those things. There being like a cool version of ecofascism, right? Like, very sort of a technocratic. Thing. Just seemed very West Coast to me. You know? Right, right. It's like not hard to see. But you're, yeah, so but sometimes if you kind of notice a current like that, then it's just probably going to happen at some point. Yeah, you just so, gotta finish the game first. <laughs> yeah, but then like two years after the game comes out, then are you hoping like that people will be like, oh wow, Laura really saw this coming? Is that No, that's so, that's so dumb though. If I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> people think I'm, people are impressed with my impressions. No, I mean, but what good is that? I don't know. So, you have to like look out for yourself a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm I'm wondering what you think. Do, do, you, do you play FromSoft games? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I played the old Armored Core like when I was a. Kid. Oh yeah, that's that's a FromSoft from game. Software. But it doesn't have a lot of lore. I guess I'm asking you. I sort of wanted to ask you about. I've only played the character lore. creators. I do the character creation. Yeah, that's one of the best parts. And really. then, like, and like, especially in like, uh, yeah, original uh, Dark Souls. Yeah. Weird character. I like the descriptions in that game of like where it's like the, the big head is like it might be intellectual or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the I guess I think of those games as also an attempt to be like, oh, we had lots of weird ideas for lore and we put them all in here and we're we don't really want people to know what they're really about. That's a good approach. More people should do that. Don't yeah. Okay. So so even so you do not play these games, but you're like, yeah, I'm on that like same. Yeah, I have that relationship with a lot of media where I'm like, I like that, but. Um, yeah, you don't want it. Yeah, you don't want it like getting, yeah, getting, getting on you. Yeah. That makes don't sense. Get yeah. No. I, yeah. I don't want to. I wouldn't want to live in the universe where it was like Laura was there, but you were obsessed with FromSoft games. I think it would just be <laughs> worse. Um, yeah. <laughs> but do you do you feel like when when you finish this game? Is it the kind of thing you would like people to make theory videos about? I don't know. I never thought about that. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Like, I think it's a. It would be funny. It would be fun to watch. I. I do well, like watching. There have been a couple of videos of like rooftop cop, and one, my favorite one, is just they hated it, but uh, their computer could barely run it. And so it was at like quarter speed, and that game is already really slow. <laughs> but they, it's like an hour and 45 minute long video of them just being like, ah. <laughs> but they did all, they played through all of it, all five parts. Wow, was that, <laughs> just was like, that game like really had like heavy requirements? No, I was just, it was the first game I ever programmed. So but it, it was just made, like, you made it in Game through. Maker, right? Yeah, it's in Game Maker. Interesting. There's way too many objects, none of them get deleted. It just... Right, so it's like not really optimized game maker. No, if you let it run for a few hours, it probably just crashes. Uh, okay, yeah, so it was just leaky, nice. So, so you tortured that computer and then you got to, you got to have a video that, of you destroy, <laughs> slowly destroying the RAM of computer. Excellent. Yeah, really good. Yeah, awesome. I, I really like that when, when you were showing the, yeah, the armor, the armor drawing game. Yeah. Um, and you were like, yeah, that was good enough. And you just stopped working on it. Uh -huh. um, 
it's so common, especially I think in maybe. So the, I guess there's two types of solo developers. I'll sort of make that as a <laughs> random statement, or, or for the purposes of this conversation, there's total perfectionists, right? And that's kind of like a famous type where you're just like, I just worked on this forever until it was exactly the way I wanted it. And then there's people who are like, bloop, 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 and like, just like, I made another one. Oh, I made another one. Oops, oops, I made another game. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's like Inkripare or someone, right? Yeah. Um, where do you feel like you fall on that spectrum? Are you like re really far towards the Inkripare side? Or are you like? I'm, I'm not that prolific. I mean, I definitely know people who are way more prolific in terms of stuff that they put out. I just. I don't know. I when I get interested in a particular kind of thing, I just see if I can do it. And once it's gotten to the point where I feel like I did it, I just at this it's a pain, like panic moment. Where I'm like, do I really want to spend like another two or three years or whatever polishing it, or making it into like a game, making sure like it takes a certain amount of time? I'm like, the answer is always no. I just don't want right. to do that. But but you spent like thousands of hours on this game. Yeah, but all of them together. That's all the thing them, is, like, right. if it was just one game, I yeah. feel like I would be on the floor. But it's many, right. it's so many, like, I yeah. could work on any of them at any time. Right, so you can just sort of jump around and yeah. be like, this part is done, you're not, not looking at it again. Yeah, I mean, some of them are done because I don't know how I, don't know how I made it, or I, I have to, like, go and relearn how it works right. for me to change it, so I'm like, mm. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. It's, um... Huh, yeah, so I guess this is a, a different approach, right? It's not just like I'm putting out all these things over and over again. It's like large because of breadth, not large because you're, you know, Jonathan Blow. And you're like, my next game is coming out in 40 years. Which is like literally, he said uh, in an auditorium here a while back or something like that. I probably still won't play it. Hmm? I probably still won't play it. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to. <laughs> um, okay, my last question before we, we take questions from other people. Um, it's the, the uh, supification of everything. Or, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I thought it was great that you described um, Vaporwave as being like a soup. And, and then also like the, the output of generative AI as being like an automated soup, soup slur or slurry maker. Soup dispenser. Soup dispenser, yeah. Um, and nobody really likes soup made by, mach by machines, right? I guess. A, or, Did you know your soup is made by a machine? A machine? <laughs> Campbell's soup comes out of a pipe into a your <laughs> Um Hand placed soup. Yeah, is this, is this, do you think this is uh, eternal human phenomenon of some kind? Like, is this part of how culture gets made? That we sort of soup things and like moments in time? Or is it a more recent phenomenon? I mean, yeah, sure. But it does, like, this particular kind of, like, mush feels new because it's, it's like, the window of time is mushing is smaller and smaller. Oh, right. We're, we're like, oh, man, remember 2014? I guess we just did that at the beginning. We were, we were like, yeah. remember 2014 when, when you were working on message? message. I guess yeah, that yeah, was yeah, a long time ago. But, but we do that, oh, right, I guess the pandemic makes us feel like, what, 2019? What, what happened in 2021? That was a million years ago. But um, I guess what I'm wondering is, yeah, I guess some people will connect this to the internet, right? Like, I think actually there was somebody on chat while, while you were talking about this. I'll, 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 I'll credit you. Lerfuller on chat um, was saying that it felt like something that the internet uh, had brought about in part because by assembling so much culture from like various times and places, it's kind of compressing everything into one momentless, placeless, place moment. Also, a lot of decontextualized culture. Right. You're like seeing dances and things from places that you've never been to. You don't know anyone who lives there, but you just see just the thing. Yeah, just the and image. And it just kind of all gets. Yeah, you don't know when it was from. You, yeah, the, or there, there's like, you, you see a video of like a, of something exploding and you're like, did that just happen? Did something just explode? And then someone's like, yes, it did. And they're like, no, this video is from three years ago yeah. or something like that. And you just don't know. Um, yeah, it's, 
do you think about that when you're thinking about the aesthetics like like vaporwave? Yeah, I mean, also that that comes back to the time thing, right? Is it's all construction? Like you could see right. a series of things, and someone could say this was a week ago, or they could say it was 15 years ago, and it completely changes your understanding of the order of things and like how the world works. And so, does that come into play in the time travel aspect of your game, like the going back and forth 50 years? Um, a little bit. It's like I kind of just do it whenever it is interesting, like per location. It's yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's funny because like, I feel more and more like when you engage with a fictional world of some kind, right? You're like, oh, I'm going to read about the history of, you know, of a, a game world in the, in the lore or by talking to an NPC. Or I'm reading a novel and it's like, oh, here in this world, 20 years ago, this kingdom was overthrown or whatever. I'm like, okay, I have to learn all this stuff. And then I'm like, oh, I have a, a much more concrete relationship because it's been laid out for me clearly than I do for my own understanding of like what happened in 2019. And I was like, wait, that was before all this stuff. I'm completely disoriented. Um, so do you feel like you're trying to articulate a, like a concrete history that people can understand in your game or capture this like, I don't know when things happened feeling? Um, it's not really concrete. I'm not like worried about architecting like a knowable history of a place it's sure more like yeah. specific specific things also that i like the idea of just being dropped in the middle uh, and like you don't really know what happens after you don't really know what happened before but there are a few little threads that you can understand um i don't know i was thinking like a 50-year span is really interesting to mm -hmm. me just like thinking about new york in the 70s when yeah. it was like sold to the banks and like wildly different like from the previous 50 years right and then new york in the 2070s well, whenever we imagine it, we're like, oh, it's just uh, covered with water or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's more, more boats. Interesting. Well, let's, let's take some questions from folks in the audience. I'm, I'm trying a new thing this year, which is I'm like running up and down the aisle. Oh, this, it's really good. I've seen this. I'm running, I'm running back after you, Alexander King. Got your hand up first. It's more of a comment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, great. When you want it somewhere else. I looked it up while we were talking, and it's true that Baum had made no references to the fine realism and stuff like that. And it was all from a 1963 teacher who wrote, like, oh, there's all this beautiful algorithms in the bottom. But yes, it's all a true picture. And so the longer your work is around, the more likely somebody will just be like, you know what Laura really meant by all of this? So, well, nice. yeah, maybe the trick is to mean something first and tell everyone. <laughs> Yeah, and then you can't. Like, oh, are you likely to do that though? Am, am I? Yeah, are you, uh, I just. You just can? Yeah. Does anyone, does anyone know what this game is about? <laughs> <laughs> like, raise your hand. All right, um, another question. Uh, hi there. Um, I guess one of the things that I struggle with is figuring out where to start. <laughs> um, when you start with like a concept, do you decide from the outset what you want to build in terms of like how to convey that concept or convey that theme? Or do you kind of find that balance between like story, dialogue, art, sound, color? Do you, does that kind of emerge as you go? Or do you say from the outset, I want to build this, these systems to convey this feeling? Uh, I, this is kind of like a murky question, but does, does do those decisions get made for you at the start, or do you just kind of find it along the way? I mean, it works different for everybody. Um, but personally, I usually, I, I don't know, the whole thing usually is, it happens at once. I'm just like, oh, it could look like this, and I can show, like, for example, like the, the Necromancer thing, I, I wrote down how I wanted it to work, vaguely. Um, I was like, I, I want to hit these points, and I want it to be like a bureaucratic one-player board game kind of a system thing, like a playable spreadsheet. And, um, and then I ran to Alexander, and I was like, Alexander, please help. Um, how how can I actually make this uh, work? Um, so, and then for some of the other ones, like the one where you're dodging AI cars, I was like, I knew I wanted to be three panels, and like I, I just like drew a picture of it, and I was like, I gotta make the cars go. So it, it depends. It's like if, if if you can think of a like a simple or like I don't know whatever the, the main action is or like what are, what is like the first thing you need to do um, just do that 
for, that sounds like a, doesn't make any sense advice. So it's like, what's the first thing you need to do? Do that first. But like, it's getting to the point where it's going to prove to you if it works at all or is a good idea. Just to get there as quickly as possible. And don't worry about the rest of the stuff. You can always remake it. So don't worry about like, as you can see, I have just like orange boxes for everything. Just like, don't, I don't make any art until I'm basically done. But don't worry about the other stuff. Yeah, until it, until it works. So I try to get to like the core idea as quickly as possible, I guess. I don't know if that answers your question, but like, yeah, you kind of just have to try it and see. I realized I, I, I promised uh, to ask you a question that we did, that I didn't get to, which is um, many of you in this room may know the, the famous philosopher named Bernard Suits, maybe because you've been forced to read uh, the Grasshopper for class. Um, and your name is Laura Sue Clark. Are you related in some way to Bernard Suits? Oh my god. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I am. Yeah. It's my great uncle. Which I didn't know until I was I like applied for grad school and I got accepted and my grandma was like, You should have this book. Um, and she sent it to me. He was already dead by then. I never got to meet him. But I have like I I've been to my my like um, aunt and uncle's house. And they have like photo albums of like Bernie suits and like he's like a teenager on the beach. So I have old archival photos of Bernard suits if anybody has them. <laughs> so he's her brother and, and she was like I no, I actually think it was her cousin. Cousin, okay. So, so my grandmother's cousin. cousin, what is that? Does somebody know? What how what is removed mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess some kind of high up in the family tree cousin. I yeah, because her her last name is Suits. So it was, his, it was her custom, yeah. We'll have to yeah, figure out some way of using that. The suit, the suit, the suit. Yeah, thank you for a great talk. It's really, really inspiring. I can't wait to play this if, if I ever do. <laughs> yeah, it's still on. You know. I mean, if you're, you're going to hope to, to live to finish it, I hope so. Um, Thanks, Jess. So I, I wanted to ask a question because speaking of time, a very long time ago, I can't remember, you gave a talk about um, rooftop cop. 2020, very long time ago. Very long time ago. <laughs> and I remember I asked you, because you had presented it as kind of a critique of policing and this idea of policing. I remember my question for you then was, because you kind of set it as you being the police, right? Like you are a cop in some of those games. And because you have such a, your style has so much humanity in it, right? It has so much like melancholy and kindness, and like at least when I, when I read it, I was like, it feels weird because you come out of it not feeling like this has been critiqued, but you feel really like sorry for these, things, right? Like it, it's it's less of like, oh, these this is the worst, and more like, oh, this is the worst. Kind of so so you know like, and I, and I think. Um, and it doesn't read as a critique as a result. It reads as a kind of, uh, I don't know, like a, not an apology, apology is the wrong term, but a, a kind of eulogy, right, for this weird way in which people thought that led them to. I was wondering, if, is, is that something that, like, is that something you're trying to work against in this game, where you're trying to make it a much more, like, sharp critique? Like, like is, it's obviously still in this, right? Like there are things in here that are themes that you want to explore in a critical way. Are you, like, is that still something that you're thinking about? Like you are, you're making us blood merchants, which is a much more pointed thing. Um, but is it, 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 do you hope that the, in, do you hope that the interpretation of this game is much more of a direct critique of these things? Or are you trying to keep it a little bit more ambiguous, a little bit more in that kind of style of your pop cop where you come out on the other side and it's like, well, these, this is horrible, but it seems like it's horrible for everyone. This is not. There aren't villains here. Yeah, well, Rooftop Cop was weird because, I mean, I guess you could feel sorry for them, but that was like a, there are only police because they were the, <laughs> only police could survive because they could do anything. And so eventually everything else was gone. I mean, it was just these people wandering around doing nothing. Um, so, yeah, I guess in this one it's, it's maybe more pointed or obvious because of like the monster thing that I mentioned, where like they are, they become not human anymore. Which I think is, is a useful way of thinking of those sorts of things, because people lose their humanity through that process. It does something to the way that you 
think is in the world. So um, maybe that is the way that it is. Because you do, I mean, you engage with that, you know, that like, necromancer board game thing, but the rest of it is like you're either the dogs or like you're um, seeing other people, you know, having a hard time and like going through whatever. So it's a completely different vantage point than, than rooftop cops. So, so maybe, yeah, I think it is, it is being addressed, but like not because I thought that the other one was a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, let's take another question. I think it's going to be passed it to you. Hi. Um, hey. This is a more practical question. A what? A more practical question. Okay, yeah. Yeah, as, a, as someone who works mostly alone and uh, has a non-linear process, uh, how, how do you go about compensating your uh, occasional co collaborators? Um, depends. Um, I I also I think about that a lot, and I always try to. I offer to pay people if it makes sense, and I do pay people. So, for example, the music. Uh, and the concept art, those are just paid. I just was like, here, yeah, I, I, this is what I want. And um, they're like, okay. And then we agree on a money thing and get the money. Um, I don't have a lot because it's just a private project. Um, but for other people, I usually do it. Um, I, I try to give them, depends. Some people want a lot of direction. Um, and some people would rather have some more creative say. And so I try to make sure that they're getting what they want out of it. And then also, if they don't want to do it anymore, or if they run out of time, or get busy, or whatever, then they can just stop. And, um, yeah. So that's kind of how it's worked for, for most of them. Like, if, if the game, if you know, the game is finished and I put it on the internet and it gets money, I will find a way to like give people money. But it's, I mean, with most games, like a lot of the Work is just upfront, and then like later you get money, and then you can divide it out. But it's like, yeah. So it depends on, on how they want to be involved. Usually, it's just conversation. All right, we're going to take one question from uh, the chat online from Pikachu. And um, do you like participating in game jams? How do you feel about game jams? I used to. I just, I don't know why I would do it by myself. I just like I would I would maybe jam with, with other people, but I just don't know when they are. There used to be like a bigger thing. Like I feel like ten years ago it was like cool, cool people were doing game jams all the time, and now it's just I don't know. And then I know that they start looting devs. You know we're having one in January, right? Which one? Yeah, yeah, I know that that happens. <laughs> I mean I know that one, but that's like right at the beginning of the semester. I don't want to like. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll make my game now and I'll pretend. <laughs> um, so as a solo developer, you, I guess my question is, how do you stay motivated? Like, I'm currently doing my own thing and sometimes I have waves of like, oh, this is not working as well as I wanted to. Sometimes, like after a playtest, I'm like inspired to work more. I think sometimes you just don't want to do it, and that's okay. I think there are times when, you know, I'll, I'll work on this for like six hours or something, and then there'll be other times when I just don't even open the project for like three weeks. Um, I just sometimes, you don't want to do it. It depends on like what your time frame is. I don't have a deadline. I just, I know that it will get finished eventually. Um, and. I, it just it takes as long as it takes. Sometimes, like I think I, I sort of mentioned it, but it's like sometimes just like go hang out with people or go do something else or like just going to bed um, will help, right? Just take some time away from it and then come back, and then that actually is way more progress on the project than just trying to power through when you aren't feeling it. You know, it's like sometimes the field is fallow. It's okay. The soil will renew and you know. Keep going. Um, yeah. All right, we have time for just a couple more questions. 
Hello. Hey, Nicole. How will you know when it's done? Um, I don't know, something you can tell me. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I will say that in the past, probably like nine months or so, it's, I, I can see like the edges. I think that that's what it is. It's just, there was a long period where I just didn't even know how big it was or like what I needed to do. Um, and at some point I was like, oh, I can see the edges now. Like I, the, the shape is discernible. Um, and so it's just a matter of like filling that out. Um, and I, you know, that's what all my little spreadsheets and documents and stuff are for is just like keeping track of like what all needs to be done. And if I can knock some stuff off of that that I'm just never gonna get to, good, then the shape gets smaller. Um, so that's kind of kind of it. I don't know, every once in a while I'll like be on a walk or take a shower or something. I'm like, oh actually these two characters are one character. Problem solved. And now I don't you know, so um, it kind of just like shapes itself as I go and um, yeah. I just I'll just know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is like a creative process question, uh, and I don't want to tell you about your creative process, but watching this and hearing you talk about how you approach these and approach your past projects, it seems like you just like you just do stuff. Like you, you something interests you, and then you go and do it. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us, first off, have a hard time even knowing if we're interested in something. And, and second, also, you would have be like, that would be cool, and then don't do it. So I don't know, like, did you have to, like, cultivate a practice of, of paying, like, an artistic practice of paying attention to what excites you, or were you always, like, sure of yourself since the age of four? I guess I'm just curious to hear more about that being in touch with yourself aspect of it. Uh, I mean, definitely not sure of myself since the age of four. Yeah. Uh, I, this is gonna sound bad maybe, but one of the reasons that I applied for game grad school is because I couldn't find any games that I thought were good. <laughs> I was like, I kinda, actually, uh, yeah, I was like, they were all a little embarrassing to me. I liked playing games, obviously, I enjoyed them, but I was like, they're kinda not very good. And I was like, there's gotta be more. And then I did find some, like, you know, that, that I do like, I, I, you know, the games by the Catamites and stuff like that. I was like, oh, you can just do whatever you want. Um, and uh, that was nice, um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, in terms of just like being interested in something, doing it. What else? What else is there? You only life's not very long. You might as well just try doing it and then see what happens. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll maybe this will be it. I'll make this game and I'll go do something else. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I certainly I didn't start making games at all until like. Nine, ten years ago, whenever I started grad school, like, so, I don't know, maybe I have other lives left to live, who knows. Do, do you feel like you have to be, like, really interested in it to start doing it, or you're like, oh, that might be interesting, and then you do it? I, I have to catch myself before I think about it too much. Like, if I'm a little bit interested in it, I'm like, I just, I gotta start now, or else I'll lose, I'll lose the, the spark, and I'll just, like, drift off and not do it. Well, that's a really interesting tip right there. I think maybe before you overthink it or plan it out too much in your head. Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I saw one other hand. Uh, did you have me ask a question? Yeah. Sorry, I hope. Hi, Laura. I wanted to ask you, so there was a funny story, an anecdote about um, how many of your precious moments. I wanted to hear that before you. Precious moments. That's good. Um, yeah, OK. I'll see if I can do like the brief version of it. Um, OK, so. There's, does anyone know the Georgia Guidestones? They blew them up, They're, they don't exist anymore. Um, but it was this big rock that someone had carved a bunch of advice onto, like how to structure your society sort of thing. And um, it was unclear like where it came from, it had been there for a long time and it's, not, it's gone now. Um, but something about that, um, everyone has kind of like apocalypse, like like apocalypse brain is like sort of in vogue now and so I thought it'd be really funny if uh, it became a trend to make your own guidestones and so everyone was just like erecting all of these like I, I call them advice columns 
which is these big <laughs> monuments of just like full of advice. And if everyone had been doing that for a long time, and there were all these big heavy <laughs> columns full of just like decontextualized advice, and then many, many years later, someone else was like collecting them, not really understanding, you know, like Victorian hair art or something, it's just like, oh, what is this? But like at the time, you know, it made sense to people to do. So like, what if there are all these big, heavy advice columns? Um, and so they're still in the game, the advice columns are there, um, but I thought it would be cool if you could read some of them in the game. And so, because the game is about like kind of mechanical Turks and AI, I tried to use, my friend Lillian and I tried to use Amazon Mechanical Turk to get people to write advice for the advice columns, and it did not go very well. Um, we tried so many times, like we, we screwed up the spreadsheet, and it was like all five questions were, were populating the same cell, and so um, I spent like hundreds of dollars on like paying people to write advice, and like the wording of the question was bad. I kept saying like, oh, if you could leave like a plaque in the desert with some advice on it that would last forever, like what would you say? And all the people kept responding, stuff like find water. It was all about the <laughs> desert. And I was like, no. So, and you can't like revise these in real time, just the wait. And so most of these people are, you know, they're getting paid like 75 cents per answer. And so they're answering as quickly as possible or they're typing A in every single thing or whatever. And so we would initially we would reject the responses. We're like, ugh, this isn't what we wanted. And then we got these like really angry emails. People were just like blacklisted from the Amazon Turk community. Please, like, and so we had to like, okay, okay, I can finally accept all the answers. You get your money and stuff. So that was a disaster. Um, so anyway, the advice columns are still in the game. You cannot read them. I don't want to write the jokes. Um, but yeah, the, the big things are still in the game. So that was the story. All right, thank you. I think that's a great note to end things on. Thank you so much. Laura, let's have a round of applause for our Lord's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I should say here, uh, in closing, that uh, Life Series is made possible by our sponsors, uh, MR Site Development, uh, Take Two Interactive, and Fresh Planet are sponsoring us this year. And you should come back here in two weeks when we will have a special guest. Frank Lance talking about his new book, The Beauty of Games, is out like next week. And then two weeks after that, one month from now, come back here again. Uh, Magna Giants, uh, their designer and writer, and games like 80 Days and many others will, will be here talking about stuff. So thanks for coming, everybody, and we hope to see you again soon. All right.